fiscal uh, context. And our efforts in Indonesia are focused on trialling innovations with local government to improve service delivery at the level at which services are delivered directly to citizens. And then what we do is work with provincial governments and the national government to change the way in which they embark on policies or practices to scale up those innovations that we've already trialled with local partners. In Timor-Leste, another country in which we work, we work across health, education, water, sanitation, gender and disability to help a small, relatively new and very fragile nation state tackle some very complex cross-sectoral challenges. Challenges like undernutrition, they have very high levels of stunting and wasting of children. Uh, very high levels of violence against women and children and very high levels of teenage pregnancy. So we work in a multi-sectoral way in, in order to tackle those cross-sectoral pro pro problems. In Papua New Guinea, which is a complex resource-rich country, one of the classic resource-cursed countries, um, with one of the highest levels of social fragmentation in the world, it has a huge amount of sort of ethnic diversity within it, uh, and where the national uh, service delivery functions are really grossly underfunded, in partly because it is such a diverse country. We've been working with local political leaders. Most of the national budget is actually allocated to individual MPs, and we've been working with those MPs to help incentivise their subsidies of service delivery, as well as working with... Um, citizen engagement and in particular the church network to strengthen the way in which citizens are oversighting service delivery. In all of these programs we're really rigorous about making sure that we work in politically smart and, lo and locally feasible ways uh, and we're also working hard to make sure that we're developing new tools for taking adaptive and iterative programming to scale in complex environments. I'm really looking forward to hearing from our panellists today to hear their ideas of how they've integrated governance to improve service delivery outcomes. I want to thank them all in advance for participating in the panel. And I'm now going to hand over to Bob Fryatt, who will moderate the session. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie, and good morning, everybody. My, my name is Bob Fryatt. I'm a public health specialist um, with um, APT Associates. Um, I spent um, my life working, my well, professional life working in health, working in NGOs, um, um, with governments. My last job before joining APT was seconded to the Ministry of Health in South Africa. I worked with DFID for many years. Um, and whilst I've always worked in health, um, right from the start of my professional career, it's pretty obvious that if you don't actually have um, good governance or if you don't think about the governance interventions, you're not going to succeed. So it's been delightful. I'm very pleased to be here today. Um, we've got a great panel that I'll introduce to you in, in a moment. Um, but I've been asked to say a few things before we start around, um, around the work we've been doing uh, in the health sector. I'm not sure if I've got... Okay. If I can make sure this works. Yeah, so as you can see from the, um, the opening uh, paragraph around this, around this seminar, we are talking about how governance is actually, governance interventions are actually pretty key to uh, achieving the sustainable de development goals. Um, and we want to talk through how that can be done um, through different sort of um, uh, uh, viewpoints from health and education and such like. Um, as you know, SD, the SDGs does actually have a, a, a governance sort of goal around peace, justice and strong institutions. But like most of the SDGs, that goal is actually key to all the other goals. And that's something we're going to explore in a bit more depth today. So up until end of September, I was the director of the Health Finance and Governance um, Project. It's a USAID uh, $200 million program that ran over six years. Um, we worked in over 40 countries over that six years. Um, our biggest countries were Ethiopia, um, Haiti, Nigeria, India, DRC and Cote d'Ivoire. But in fact, we had a long tail of countries working around, around the globe. Um, and our job really was to 
worked with uh, USAID and partners in country to actually expand essential health services, but through improving health finance and health governance. We also worked for the Office for Health Systems here in DC, um, and they requested us that we actually work with other partners, other um, US, uh, USAID implementing partners, but also the World Health Organization, to actually make the case, the, pull together the evidence that actually you need governance interventions to, um, to deliver on health. Um, and to me, this is a bit of a, a bit of a no-brainer, given my sort of background. But I, it, it was clear that actually not everyone was convinced, not everyone had seen the arguments. Um, so we pu started pulling together what I think is pretty compelling evidence that actually um, to deliver health, you need to actually have uh, look for a governance lens and have governance interventions. And so we actually had um, international working groups working on accountability on um, institutionalizing knowledge as it, from a governance point of view, um, public financial management, and also policies and regulation. We could have chosen many other areas, but those are the four areas thought to be most, most useful. So that came up with um, put, putting together the main literature, um, the links between governance interventions and governance results and health outcomes. And um, then they got published in this series of documents last year. And then I just want to give a, just a, a couple of examples or three examples of the work that we actually got involved in in countries. So in Nigeria, um, USAID um, asked us to get involved, uh, to help work with uh, governments and civil society to mobilize, help mobilize domestic resources for health. Um, uh, because the, the actual sort of, in, within Nigeria, the, the government's contribution is quite relatively low. Um, but to do that, we had to think and we had to work politically. We had to um, work with uh, legislators at the, the state and federal level. Um, and by working with them, um, we helped them set up a, a legislative network, uh, which actually started working together across the states and the federal level to start lobbying and, and uh, advocating for more money for health. And that was key to actually mobilizing and then eventually spending more money on health. In Ethiopia, um, the main, uh, as you know, I'm sure many of you know Ethiopia, that the, the, the main aim is to get more services across the country, essential services to people. Um, we were asked to work around to support the government on its financing reforms um, to help achieve that goal. Um, and our first set of in interventions were actually to work um, with uh, sub-national governments to help strengthen the governance and oversight mechanisms for health facilities, to get better participation from local communities, um, but to, to bring more transparency and oversight to what happens in that facility. So when resources are retained in that, in that facility, they are better used. Uh, and that <coughs> relatively straightforward intervention uh, about improving the governance facilities actually had a phenomenal effect. Not only it improved the quality of services, uh, but also it laid the foundation for more sophisticated um, uh, reforms around community-based health insurance that came in later on. It built credibility to those reforms, it helped, it helped scale them up, and that is hopefully now going to become a national, nationwide financing reform um, with quite significant impact, we think. In Guinea, uh, we were asked by USA to work with partners there to um, in post Ebola to help um, prevent uh, the same sort of disasters happening in the in the, in the future. But our role was to help strengthen the the, the key institutions that oversee an emergency outbreak response, uh, mainly with the ministries of health and the institutions working with them, but also with the Auditor General's office. Um, we worked with the, the politicians, the legislators that oversee and make that Ministry of Health accountable. Um, and this was a sort of nuts and bolts um, building up capacity around their finance and management systems, about their personnel management systems, as well as their oversight mechanisms and audit mechanisms. Um, and that helped bring them back, not only their confidence, but also their sort of credibility in the country. So that when, uh, a, a, should a similar problem happen again, they'd be much better able to deal with it and lead it. And lack of leadership was, was one of the national leadership, was one of the problems, as you know, about the um, an, an Ebola response. So I'm now going to move to our panelists. Um, we have um, a great group here to speak to you, talking about experiences from other parts of uh, around um, international d development. Um, 
I will just go through what we're going to... They're each going to say a little bit about their own experiences, um, and then we're going to come back to some common questions, which I just want to show you um, now. We have Carol Jenkins, Chief, Chief Executive for World Learning, who will be talking about education. Carol, perhaps you could join us. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm going, I'm going backwards. Um, so I thought I had the questions. So we'll be to, when we come to the questions, we'll be talking about um, what governance interventions that, that, that the panellists have experienced to deliver on results. We'll be talking about what's the role of donors, grants and um, lenders in actually strengthening governance. And then we want to talk about, um, we have some questions around how do we work together around vulnerable, you know, protecting vulnerable communities through better governance and interventions across all the different sectors and projects that we work in. Anyway, so we have Carol will be kicking off, um, um, and Carol is the uh, Chief Executive for the World Learning. Christy, would you like to join us? Christy Ogamba is the Director for the Big Coordination for Care USA. And then we have Stephen Laurie online, hopefully. Stephen, are you, are you with us? I am. <coughs> Can you hear me? Great. So Stephen is the Director for Gender Equality Justice and tenure for the Centre for International Forestry Research, and Steve's on a mission in sort of rural um, Nepal at the moment, so he's joining us from there, and um, so it's great that that's all working. And then we have David Jacobson, like, David likes to join us, um, who's a democracy specialist, work for Human Rights and, and Governance Centre, uh, and the cross-sectoral programme team at USAID. So we're going to kick off in, in that, go off in that order. Um, as I said, we're going to, the panelists will give a short presentation in, in their, around their areas, and then we will come to the questions after that. So, Carol, over to you. Do you want to? Yeah, I think I need to put So I have some pictures and some numbers, but I'm not going to necessarily refer to those. Those are just so that you can see some of the outcomes from the projects that I'm going to be sharing with you. So it's really a pleasure to be here um, and to share with you World Learning's experience and programs related to SDG 4, which is ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning opportunities for all. As part of this panel, I hope to convey to you how our efforts to promote good governance are critical if we are to make progress toward that goal. World Learning is more than 85 years old, and we are no, both now an accredited academic institution and an international NGO committed to a more peaceful and just world. Just a little bit of explanation about who we are. We provide study abroad programs for undergraduate students master's programs, and high school exchange programs. And as I said, we are an international NGO that partners and implements programs around the globe, and we partner with USAID and the State Department, as well as other donors, other governments, uh, private and institutional donors. So in the next four minutes, I assume that I have left, I want to share the following with you. I want to cover two areas. I want to focus on three of our theories of change or our hypotheses related to SDG 4 and the importance of good governance. And then I want to share with you about two of our programs in Lebanon and in Pakistan. So first, let me share some theories of change. I won't go into the details, but I want to pull out some important components. And I hope that you will see that pulling key stakeholders together is critical for success. So first, let me share our basic education theory of change. Children are problem solvers of tomorrow. <coughs> we believe that a flexible approach is needed that emphasizes inclusion and experiential learning. Through our cyclical development process, we strengthen four key players, school administration, teachers, the community, and the government. All are critical to an educational system. Second theory of change is on workforce development and entrepreneurship. World Learning believes that societies and economies are stronger when each person contributes to individual and community prosperity. World Learning realizes this through five strategies. I'm not going to go into the details, but I want to pull out some of them for you. We believe it's important to build skills holistically through a comprehensive focus on civic engagement, entrepreneurship, and employability, including the fields of science and technology. 
We believe it's important to strengthen linkages with the private sector by reinforcing career development centers, skill certification programs, business incubators, and government policies. What's the point of an education? Why are we educating people? We expand and improve work opportunities by encouraging youth-led community projects, promoting entrepreneurship, organizing work placements, and promoting good policy. And then finally, we believe it's important to develop a culture of mentoring upon our, among our program alum, parents, employers, and the communities. So third theory of change and final one that I want to share with you. This is on inclusion. We believe that everyone has a right to education for work and life, as well as the opportunity for further growth. Our inclusion theory of change is rooted in the belief that expanding agency, access, and power of historically marginalized populations and excluded people requires tackling deeply embedded norms and structures. Thus, key players must be engaged across multiple levers of the, levels of the system to see success. That includes institutions, private sector entities, members of civil society, and mentoring roles, and the government. And they must be deeply aware of their own role in the power dynamics within the system. So if you remember nothing else from what I've said, I'd ask you to remember this. Engaging all of the key actors is critical for success. So even if you as an implementer, or as a donor, or as a participant can't do it all, make the linkages. Create the partnerships. Advocate for engaging everyone. You don't have to do it all yourself, but we have to find the ways to ensure that we're making those linkages in the case of education, linking the classroom, the teachers, the policies, the ministries, the systems, the communities, the parents, and of course the students themselves. So now on to just a couple of examples. I won't go into the details, but I'm happy to, as we go into questions, respond um, as appropriate. First one is Lebanon, which I think is up there. Um, what we're doing in Lebanon right now is working with the, the central ministry. So we're working with the Ministry of Education and Higher Education to expand equitable access and improve learning outcomes for vulnerable students in the Lebanese schools. And as you probably know, many of the public schools, they're being flooded with Syrian refugees. So this project is really working with the ministries, but making those linkages across the school, the educational system, and with the teachers. So a couple of areas that we're working on are strengthening the assessment data. A second key area is leveraging monitoring and evaluation data. So that means enabling the actual teachers to collect data that can be transferred to the ministry who's actually making policy. And then, of course, supporting the ministry to develop a high-level strategic plan. And the second program that I want to share with you is, where am I at here, is on Pakistan. Let me go back. And we're working not at the national level, but at two provincial or regional levels in two areas. So it's a little bit different. And what we're doing there is to assist the government to revise curriculum, textbooks, and develop standards. We're supporting policy development for reading. We're scaling up teacher training approaches. And we're promoting uh, private sector linkages. And there are some great examples of that. Um, again, this is funded by USAID, and it's a wonderful way to engage at a non, not, not at the highest level of the government, um, but at one sort of one, at least one level down, and really trying to find a way to make the linkages across the system to support learning outcomes. And with that, I'm going to stop. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Carol, that's excellent. Thanks very much. Um, please hold your questions. We're going to go through them. There's lots in there that we'd like to come back to. Um, so now over to Christy uh, from CARE, who's going to cover um, to see governance interventions from a food security perspective. Yes. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Christy. I'm excited to, to talk to you today. I'll give you just a really brief introduction to CARE, um, if you haven't heard of us before. Um, we are an organization that started back in 1945, sending, how many of you have ever heard the term care packages? Yes. Yeah, that comes from us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we send care packages literally to um, Europe as part of um, 
uh, providing um, supplies to people who were recovering from, from the war. Uh, since then, we've expanded uh, globally to, to focus on everything um, from uh, all aspects of development all the way through um, humanitarian aid as well. Uh, people often ask me of what does CARE do? We um, respond to needs based on uh, what the needs are in a country. Um, so we literally do everything. We work in climate change, we work in governance, we work in food and nutrition security, we work in education, uh, because we are uh, responsive to, to the context. So today I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about um, our inclusive governance um, approach. So in our programming we have uh, a heavy focus on, on women and girls. We, we believe that if you want to um, address um, poverty, if you want to address social injustice, uh, they are um, central um, to, to that approach. Um, within our um, programming, we focus on gender, govern, uh, inclusive governance, and resilience. Uh, that's at the core of everything we do. We have these great markers um, where we take every project and we rate them against um, how well we are incorporating these things. So it's a big part of our theory of change that you have to hit all of those. But I'll tell you today a little bit about our inclusive governance um, theory of change, um, which is rooted in, well, you can read it on the slide. So if marginalized, um, or, if marginalized populations organize or individual citizens, excuse me, are empowered, if power holders are effective, accountable, and, re and responsive, and if spaces for negotiation are created, expanded, effective, and inclusive, then sustainable and equitable development can be achieved. Um, when we talk about empowered, we, we work a lot with um, women and girls, with youth, with marginalized communities. Um, and it is our belief that as you empower them, as you help citizens understand what their rights are, help them to organize and to advocate for those rights, then we are moving towards sustainable and equitable de development. Key part there is equitable. Um, if you aren't engaging um, these populations, it's very unlikely that of any type of development will be equitable. Um, mm -hmm. So bringing in those partic uh, that participation, bringing in those voices is, is a key part of what we do. The other part of it though is great, they can advocate, um, but if there aren't changes in the systems, if there aren't changes in, in service providers, the way they're doing things, then we're not really creating any, any type of change. So the third piece of that is really about bringing them all together. Um, you'll notice here that it says power holders. It doesn't just say government. Um, we recognize that uh, those in power can be um, many different stakeholders. Um, it can be in the private sector. It can be um, local leaders. Um, so the point is, is that we're looking at um, the context very specifically to identify who are the power holders. Um, and how do we bring uh, the power holders and citizens together um, to create um, change? So how do we do that particularly in our, in our uh, food and nutrition security work? Um, so we have an initiative called She Feeds the World. Um, that's kind of the basis of, of all the work that we do and it focuses on access to markets, um, uh, nutrition, uh, var various things. Uh, but when we put on our inclusive governance um, lens, um, then we narrow it down to, to three key points, and those are the ones that I'm going to cover today. That people know and act on their rights. So I already covered that a little bit, but what does that look like um, in a food security context? Um, so we're looking at uh, land rights, um, understanding what um, people have access to, what they don't have access to, and what, what they can advocate for. Um, natural resource governance um, is, a, is another uh, key point that we um, look at. Uh, we look at a lot of community management. Um, uh, extension services, um, it really just helping people to understand what um, is available to them um, and what they have a right to, to access. This also includes a heavy focus on developing women and girls and youth um, as leaders in their community. Um, they are often marginalized from um, discussions around policy or around changes or initiatives um, that directly impact them. Um, so we do a lot that really focuses on building um, their partic participation in the community. Um, and then as well, uh, on the influencing, you'll see in a second, I'll talk a little bit about um, what we're doing to just take these initiatives um, throughout the, at a systems level, right? Of uh, advocating um, for, for changes um, and getting particularly governments to adopt some of these participatory um, initiatives. And then the final, final one is brokering those linkages and creating those spaces. And um, I'll talk in a second about our community scorecard. 
So I'm just going to highlight a, a couple, and I'm happy to circle back um, in our discussion about these. Um, but one here that I'll um, flag is our BRACE um, project in, in Niger, um, where we are working with communities around climate change and uh, dis disaster risk um, reduction, but actually getting them involved to articulate the needs that they have, the way they are being impacted um, by, by climate change, and becoming aware of what are uh, the resources available to them, and actually participating um, um, with uh, local actors um, to come up with plans um, in a community um, development um, approach. Um, here I'll focus just on um, so many I could talk about. <laughs> um, maybe just a quick point on our Shuhardo 3 project. Um, we actually, Shuhardo um, is a project in, in Bangladesh that we, we implement, uh, where the government of Bangladesh actually, um, through our collective advocacy and demonstrating the value of, uh, of our project, is actually contributing 10% of the program funds um, to that project. And that's a really exciting initiative we are trying to replicate in some other places we've done as well in Ethiopia, of, again, making sure that it's not just people advocating, right, but that we're dealing with the, the power holders um, to identify how they um, can contribute to this process and, and work together um, with communities. And then the final one, um, and again, happy to discuss this a little bit more um, when we have our, our questions, uh, it's around brokering linkages. And we do this in a lot of different ways. We do participatory um, budgeting, where we'll actually have citizens work with local governments to uh, develop budgets or monitor budgets. Uh, but our, our most well-known and, and our most successful one is the community scorecard. Um, and this is a participatory approach where we bring communities and service providers or local actors or government or, or whoever um, together. And each one um, create a, indicators in which they say, um, you know, these are the things that we want as a community from our service provider, from our extension officers or, or whatnot. Um, and, and similarly, you'll have extension officers do the, do the same, and they say, well, this is what we think we should be providing. So we have each map that out, map out the indicators, and they score themselves. Of how, how, or score, the extension officers will score themselves, the community will score the extension officers, for example. Um, and then they sit down and they have a conversation about it. It's not about pointing fingers or, or anything. It's about really building trust and bringing people to, together to have these conversations. And again, uh, happy to discuss that a little further in a during our questions. Thank you very much. Well, all of you can um, hear that some of these governance interventions that are common to all of what we're doing is beginning to come out, the things that you're saying, which is great. So we'll come back to that. But now we're gonna move to Stephen Laurie, um, who is gonna be speaking to us from Nepal. Because Stephen, if you're on the line, over to you. Thank you, Kerry. Hello. Hi. Yes, we can hear you. I think you need to speak up, but we can hear you. Yes. Oh. Okay. Very good. Uh, well, we'll just start with the uh, first of all. Thanks for the invitation. Very pleased to be here. Uh, although I'm in Nepal, <laughs> in a small uh, village with pretty Wi-Fi actually. Uh, mm -hmm. But let's look at the first slide, Dr. And uh, I try to give a sense of what my community for it really began as sort of a really top-down government programs supporting reforestation. They were generally not successful uh, because they, they sort of lack the sort of sufficient uh, to keep engaged for the long term. And there was this sort of movement led uh, by NGOs uh, uh, in the land rights movement for assigning or devolving rights to forests to local communities. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> the argument was that by devolving rights, uh, communities would be able to exercise better governance uh, uh, over the resources, benefit uh, uh, with respect to their livelihoods, uh, and uh, we would see uh, generally better environmental outcomes. And I should note, that, though, that uh, developing country governments have, for the most part, been somewhat ambivalent about rights to devolution, with a few notable exceptions, and I'll be speaking about some of those today. Okay. But there has been what we call a forest tenure transition. I'm sorry, next slide. And then the forest then the next slide, forest tenure transition in Latin America. We have sort of data over a sort of a six-year period uh, in Latin America that shows there's quite a significant devolution of rights from states, that is the blue kind of uh, band, 
uh, zone on the band in 2002 was about 70% in 2002. Uh, that's reduced significantly uh, to about 36% in 2008. But those were quite distributed uh, among, say, the green um, community ownership, including most particularly uh, indigenous uh, communities. Uh, next slide, please. The transition has been much less, uh, well, uh, to say the least, much less extensive in Africa. There, there are a, a, a variety of explanations for this, but the uh, forest rights devolution movement has not gotten a lot of traction uh, in Africa for reasons that we can discuss. If we look sort of at a global context, uh, this is a graphic that's, that it tries to demonstrate, characterize the name rights from by more rights and what kinds of tenure regimes are associated with those. For instance, a collective title to land and forests uh, on the right side, which we see these are sort of uh, initiatives more generally associated with Latin America, where there's been a stronger movement toward revolution. And then uh, with respect to Africa, what we would call sort of a really weak kind of rights initiative, which we, we would characterize as benefit sharing. Uh, then I want to talk a little bit about what we've been learning about uh, the success factors that contribute to uh, community forestry success. That is in, measured in terms of the intended outcomes of the various projects. And those outcomes usually relate to environmental uh, and, uh, and uh, social benefits. So there's a slide here with the lots of circles on it. I don't know if you're seeing that. I don't really want to talk about that <laughs> at the moment. I want to move around, along to the sex slide. The next slide, which is key factors which influence the success of community forestry uh, in development, developing countries. Uh, and this is based on a very extensive survey of uh, community forestry over a 20 to 30 year period in the Philippines, Nepal, and Mexico. Uh, really a systematic review that found that secure property and tree and land rights were necessary conditions for success. And material benefits to community members are also necessary factors. And by this we mean widely distributed uh, benefits because when we think of the forest as a commons with everyone having an ownership stake in it, then all right holders have uh, a reasonable expectation to expect that they'll benefit from any sort of investments uh, and enterprises that are associated with the commons. We also see number four that intercommunity forest user group governance is very important. So next slide, uh, and then I wanna talk about Nepal uh, we've been doing research on the investment effects of rights devolution in four countries, Nepal, Guatemala, and Mexico, the forests in Namibia for wildlife. And so since I'm in Nepal, I'll speak about Nepal, where Nepal had, but it was the classic model of state ownership of forests up until the 1980s when we saw this sort of initiative really in the face of significant failure of state ownership uh, with respect to environmental management, loss of uh, forest cover on hillsides, uh, extensive erosion, uh, uh, contributing to flooding. Uh, and so the government sort of said, with the urging of uh, a lot of NGOs, well, let's try something else. Let's give rights to communities. And there's been significant success as a result. Uh, today, the forest cover has increased by 13% uh, between 1990 and 2014. Those of you who have a, the good fortune of visiting Nepal will find very verdant forests around the country. About 40% uh, of the population is involved in community forest user groups. There are 20,000 registered community forest user groups managing about 33% of Nepal's forest area. There have been significant investment effects, uh, livelihood effects. I won't go th into those in detail uh, as in terms of uh, generally speaking, but I, I was today, this is a picture from a visit to a community forest user group today. This particular community in the in uh, the, the hill zone of uh, Nepal uh, owns 52 uh, hectares of, uh, of a pine plantation. Uh, each family in the community, there are 84 communities, 84 families in the community uh, are assigned 35 cubic meters of wood annually, which they can use for various purposes, including selling them to this uh, timber mill, which is owned by a collective of four community forest user groups. Uh, the uh, leadership here estimated that uh, on average, between 10 and 50 percent of, of average household income is derived from uh, timber production, all of which is done on a sustainable uh, basis. And we here's up just a shot of of the uh, the pine plantation that this particular community owns. 
So what we've learned also uh, is that uh, we've drawn some conclusions about this whole, you know, what happens when communities get rights. And this is a particular area of interest and investment, I think, for donors, because this is really a stage process. Uh, communities get rights in the context where they haven't had rights for decades or, or longer. And so there are questions arise about governance and uh, in the first instance. And so we find that rights to evolution triggers new kinds of action, social and economic at the local level, and externally that lays the foundation for investment in new forms of community forest enterprises. Uh, so there's a time dimension to this. Readiness takes time. And then there's a very important social character uh, to this process, which I've spoken about previously, and that everyone who's a stakeholder in the community uh, expects quite rightly to benefit. And so we see three fair phases. First, there's inward investment and development of local representative institutions uh, that are vital. Accompanying this is formation of regional and national organizations and federations that represent the community groups. Uh, and then stage two, hope we're, you're keeping up with me, <laughs> uh, is community institutions gaining confidence, local leaders and entrepreneurs emerge. Uh, we see other aspects of reform externally. We call this uh, uh, sort of forest reform or rights to evolution and plus investment in roads, training, health, education, public goods, and so on, analogous to successful programs of the 60s. And then we see in stage through stronger local social capital attracts new forms of bridging, cap, bridging capital with significant external investment uh, being evidenced in the countries that we've been looking at. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that because I think I've run a little bit over time uh, and I'm happy to respond to uh, 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 questions uh, during the question period. Stephen, thanks very much indeed, and, and truly impressive to have that from a field trip in Kathmandu. Um, I'm sort of a big sigh of relief that that all works. Um, and just to say the presentation, which has a lot in it, will be, uh, will be available um, online and be sent around for you to look at later on. So thanks very much for that. I think actually, had, had Stephen had a beneficiary online as well, we would have given him a real gold star, but that was quite, <laughs> that was quite something. So thanks very much. Um, so, sure. um, so now I'd like to turn over to David. Um, um, so you're going to talk about a crossing, working across these sectors, across these projects, about your perspective from USA. So David, over to you. Thanks, Bob, and thanks for having me here to speak about this and to have such rich examples to, uh, to kind of fill in the gaps of um, what this means. I'll talk at kind of a broad level about some of what uh, has driven uh, governance integration and DRG integration, as we call it, at USAID. Um, so uh, I sit in the Cross-Sectoral Programs Division in the Democracy Rights and Governance Center. Um, and so uh, that division was formed uh, in 2011, uh, and it's related to the agency's 2012 DRG strategy, which identified integration as kind of a, a key issue that we wanted to advance. Um, and you know, this is uh, mostly to help uh, you know, bring um, or to bring a focus and emphasis on participation and inclusion and transparency and accountability um, across all of the investments that USAID makes uh, in order to better contribute to sustained development. Um, and uh, I mean, of course, uh, that was for our division kind of a formal starting point, but this has a much longer track record. Um, and so folks within the agency and outside of it have been working at this intersection point for a long time, um, but that kind of gave us a renewed impetus um, and since the division was set up, um, we have uh, kind of seen a spread of this area of emphasis through things like uh, several missions hiring DRG integration advisors as part of their staff. Um, we've been able to offer training. We've collaborated with folks in other sectors to kind of do joint training and joint uh, set up working groups to explore issues. Um, worked a little bit on some areas of policy and guidance, um, and I think that's something where um, more recent shifts uh, and kind of the agency direction uh, focusing on each country's journey to self-reliance has uh, accelerated that. Um, you know, when you, when you think about what self-reliance depends on and requires, a lot of it has to do with uh, kind of the governance uh, structures and setups within a country, within a sector, within whatever, um, you know, system it is that we're looking at. 
Um, and so uh, kind of some of our forthcoming um, guidance for ourselves, our, our policy framework that's in draft, um, is going to have more um, kind of specific language to identify how USAID should work in the context of supporting uh, countries on their journey to self-reliance. And uh, I think we see that from our cross-sectoral programs division as a renewed driver to pay more attention to the longer term, to make sure that our investments are both achieving results and um, setting up results to be sustainable, um, and thinking about what that sustainability depends on, which tends to push back toward um, kind of governance uh, in many cases. Um, in terms of, um, you know, and I should also note that there, there's a lot of rich experience coming from other sectors. So I think initially, because this was set up within the DRG Center and as part of our sector strategy, um, there was a little bit of a sense of like, we're gonna go tell these folks in other sectors about the importance of these issues. Um, and pretty quickly we, re we realized that they had a lot more to tell us than we had to tell them. Um, and so I think it's been um, a good mutual learning process to find out um, different ways to support governance in different sectors and there are groups, whether it's the policy office in the Bureau of Food Security, the health systems office uh, in global health, there are, there are folks who kind of by the nature of where they sit and their work are natural allies and champions for um, governance integration. Um, you know, there are still, of course, some, some challenges and part of what we have uh, kind of learned from our experience that I think is worth sharing are some of the entry points, are some of the places where we've had the most um, fruitful collaboration with people in other sectors. Um, and you know, a lot of this has to do with um, our sense of kind of taking a, um, a power and incentives look at um, how development happens. So a lot of this, we, we call this thinking and working politically or context-driven adaptation. Um, we've created a, an agency political economy analysis tool and we've kind of supported a, a lot of training and workshops to try and integrate that into programming. We see quite a deal of interest and uptake around that. Um, we also have found that kind of work with civil society, whether it's just core civil society strengthening or whether it's civil society's role in kind of social accountability um, is often an entry point to collaborate with other sectors. Um, work on policy change. There's a lot of kind of DRG experience and track record going back many, many years on implementing policy change that, um, you know, it's a crux issue for folks working in a lot of sectors and we've had a lot of collaboration around that. Um, public financial management and public accountability um, are kind of entry points where um, a lot of DRG officers have more understanding of where some of the um, pressures and processes are that can matter to those outcomes. Um, and so that's been a good entry point with some sectors. Um, and decentralization, um, and I think less decentralization as a thing that we are pushing and promoting and more um, how do you support more effective local governance in the context of kind of um, uneven and often self-contradictory arrays of uh, devolved powers and decentralization more generally that exist in a lot of the country contexts and affect sector programs. Um, there are also some interesting um, challenges that show up, and so um, you know I can get into the, the question and answers into more details around what some of those are in terms of um, structurally working in a bureaucracy and ways of working. Um, but uh, the one that I think is probably worth highlighting um, for this group is um, the challenge of language um, and how we can be using the same terms to mean different things. Um, you know, accountability when you're talking in the context of a health clinic that is trying to deliver to certain standards of quality and care and they have some supportive supervision overseeing it and then they also have maybe some citizens entitled to certain rights and expectations when they come there is a very different um, animal and means a very different thing when people say we want to work on accountability than if you're looking at uh, a forest users group and thinking about the kind of mutual accountability or the accountability under a um, kind of uh, legal regime that has devolved certain authorities to that users group. So we often found in the early days that we thought we were having the same conversation, but we were using the same words and talking past each other a little bit. Um, and I think um, the other lesson that is important to bear in mind, I mean, we have uh, DRG integration as our um, raison d'etre. We very strongly believe in it and think that it's integral to a lot of um, outcomes, and we've seen that. We've, we have in our annual uh, performance reporting a key issue where other sectors report on where they have 
um, kind of achieved objectives through governance integration, and we see a lot of good work that is uh, very field driven. But I think importantly, um, this depends on um, really addressing something that's felt by both sides as a problem where collaboration can help to overcome it. So we've had a lot more work, um, a lot more success working with missions where people are frustrated that some problem, the approach hasn't taken root as much as they wanted to or uh, you know, has gotten to a certain level but is stymied by larger governance constraints and we want to work on that problem jointly. Um, and I think one of the um, ironic uh, challenges within that is that often some of the most successful work, um, some of the practices within market systems work that I see uh, and how they've shifted to a market systems approach from value chain approaches in some of the economic growth and food security work really, really integrates um, kind of a lot of these concepts really well, um, but has become for a lot of the people in that sector just how you do that work. And so it becomes invisible as an example of integration and we perhaps don't learn as many lessons as we could from our successes. Uh, I would say the same for some of the health systems work because you need to be able to do some translation to pull out from people who have absorbed it to the point where it's just how you go about doing good work in that sector to still kind of keep it visible as an example of applied governance integration. Um, and so I think that that's um, you know, that's been a really interesting challenge in terms of, um, and some interesting successes in terms of being able to um, have different ways to talk about the same array of work um, and to mean the same things sometimes with different language as opposed to using the same language to mean different things. So I'll stop there and we can get perhaps more into the details in questions and answers. David, thanks very much. Uh, and Great, and that leads quite nicely into our first um, uh, question or little discussion we're going to have. Um, so I'm going to turn back to the panelists, um, starting with Steve and then Carol and Christy, um, and say we've just heard from David now. So what are the common governance interventions that have produced the solutions for the problems that you, that, that you faced? Um, so Steve, if you're still with us, can we start with you? Sure. Uh Happy to comment. Um, well, you know, with respect to the community forest, uh, the, the, the key intervention was a commitment to uh, in policy uh, and then in law to devolving rights to communities. Uh, and you know, that was a pretty heavy lift in its own in its own right uh, because there's you know many decades <clears throat> uh, going back to the colonial era of uh, of state uh, ownership and management uh, of resources, uh, uh, forests, and other natural resources. And kind of a discourse around why we really can't trust communities to manage these resources uh, sustainably, um, and uh, and so on. So, so it was you know quite a debate. A lot of donor input uh, and NGO and advocacy input was key in that. But the but getting the policy shift was just the beginning. Uh, then there was the the law that had to be framed, and 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 then uh, the next step was typically. Uh, sort of the implementing regulations. And we found that at, the, at the, the regulatory design stage that the forest agencies would often resist uh, the, uh, the law. And not really uh, purposefully, they were sort of, uh, you know, being loyal civil servants for the most part. But there was a whole set of internal structural changes that needed to happen in many cases uh, to bring the forest, the, the, the roles and functions of the Forest Service in line with a new kind of relationship with communities which were, were now rights holders that were empowered to make their own judgments about how to manage the resources, you know, consistent with PAN's plans that were uh, overseen and approved and so on. And so this tension, we've seen this in the in the Paul, has often undercut this sense of security uh, on the part of uh, many of the, of the community forestry unit groups. So I, I guess in conclusion, I would say that you really need to see alignment uh, from policy, law, regulation, and then some really key programmatic and administrative and bureaucratic reforms. And, and my sort of, um, uh, I'll just call it frustration, has been, well, here's a recommendation that really donors can do great service by focusing on also on the reform of the agencies. And we tend not to see that as, a, as, a, as an investment opportunity on the part of donors. Thank you. Um, Carol, education big governance interventions that bring you success? Sure. Um, I'm thinking back to something you said early. Um, some of this 
seems to be a no-brainer. And I think it's often not a no-brainer, apparently. And so I'm going to state some, some examples that when I heard about them from some of the program staff on the ground, I was intrigued, but it also reminded me um, that sometimes we don't need to get too um, fancy about what we think needs to be done, but we need to really be sort of practical and have some common sense. And I'll focus on the Pakistan Reading Project for a moment, which is about improving reading outcomes. And just very simply, Things are going well, but if in the actual classrooms, the time for students to actually read isn't there, it's going to be very difficult even if everything else is going quite well. So, so being able to, to sort of realize that at a classroom level, you've got to give time in the actual span of that setting to allow kids to just read and enjoy reading. I think about, when I heard about that, I thought, well, that, that totally makes sense, of course. I remember when I was a kid thinking about being able to sit and have some time just to read whatever you wanted to read and the joy of reading. And those, that seems very simple. It seems like a no-brainer. Um, but it's often not because we get very caught up in you know, measuring and, and all these very um, technical ways of engaging. And we've got to remember to be at sometimes very practical. And so that, as it turns out, did in fact improve reading outcomes. In, but, it, but it required some, some changes, of course, to the curriculum and the way in which the teachers were engaging and the way in which they were being evaluated for what they were doing in the classroom. So that's one example that I wanted to share with you. And then just another thing I'd say is about assessment. And I mentioned this earlier on. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in Lebanon, as an example, is really increasing access to information. And I guess something that, that is also to be learned, and it's not so, it's very similar, I think, to what we experience here in the US, to what I experience with staff as I try to govern an organization. You want to give, you want to give the stakeholders an opportunity to self-assess, not just to have others come in and assess, not just to have the group, whatever their, their, their label is within, within a school administration system, who their job is to go and assess, you actually need to have the ability for teachers and administrators to do some of their own self-evaluation, because that gives them sort of a stake in it. They're part of the, the story that's being painted. They're part of the information that's being gathered. And so that's just another very, Sometimes it, again, seems like a very practical example, but if you're looking to really make information transparent and make people actually engage with the data as opposed to just say, there we go again, they're assessing, no, I have got no sort of stake in this, um, you, you will be much more successful if you bring people in so that they feel like they're part of the solution. Great, thank you very much indeed. That that brings me back. I love the idea of actually participatory development. I mean, giving children time to read. It's lovely. Yeah. It reminds me of when I was a doctor, and some doctors didn't realize you had to have to do participation with patients to actually get the benefits. <laughs> yeah. They sometimes forget that. Um, great. So, Christy, um, from your perspective, food security, what are the key governance interventions? Yeah, I might well actually build a little bit on that. Um, I already talked about the community scorecard, and, and that is one of our most effective um, approaches. We did a randomized controlled study a few years back, and it, it was significant. Uh, the results that we got when we introduced the community scorecard versus when, when we did it. Um, so that one is unique, not just that it brings people to, together to have those conversations and builds trust. and. Uh, but it also includes every six months they're, they're checking in um, and they're continuing that conversation. Um, and it's really about bringing kind of supply and demand together, right? That communities get to, to articulate what, what are we looking for? What do we want from our local government, from our service providers, from our extension officers or, or whatnot? Um, and those providing those services are able to, to respond to that. Um, so that's one of our, our uh, most successful um, initiatives. Uh, linked with that, though, is often community action plans, um, and that's where communities come together um, to say, here are our needs. Here are the things that, that we want to see. Um, there's problems with watershed management. How are we going to, to solve that? Um, and so it, it's interesting that, again, when you 
bring communities into, into the process to um, work with uh, those who are supposedly leading development um, at a systems level, uh, you know, whether it's the government or the private sector or, or whatnot, um, that the inclusion of communities and in, in really driving um, that forward um, is, is really significant. I'll give one other example and um, uh, related to land management um, that um, we, we had a project where they're in uh, Mali where lots of drought, lots of conflict, um, whatnot, and um, there were transhuman pastoralists um, who were coming back and forth and it was just fueling the, the conflict. And so we worked with traditional land management committees that had always existed but had never really been uh, effective, had never really been empowered to, to play that role. Um, by introducing them, uh, they were able to, to manage um, the land much better and to uh, established times when the pastoralists could come through and, and when they couldn't and, and whatnot. And it led to a significant um, decrease in conflict over, over resources, um, which allowed for more land to, to be used, um, and particularly um, women um, to uh, have greater access to, to land, thus increasing uh, their access to resources. So it, it's, it's this um, effect that happens that when when you bring communities in and they start to become part of that solution really drive drive that then we start to see um, that ripple effect um, and uh, uh, increased outcomes in, in really critical areas thank you very much um, well that leads us on to our next um, session in this discussion is that we've been hearing about these the importance of governance interventions um, for, for all of us so, um, for, so how, but how can donors, those that fund exter uh, particularly external assistance, how can donors best achieve those governance results um, through the loans and, and grants, given the fact that a lot of them are fo focused on very specific social goals? So Steve, can you get, like to get your perspective first of all? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> you know, there have been uh, significant contributions by donors to ensuring that women uh, participate more fully in uh, in public life and in uh, various governance institutions. And I would give an example once again of of Nepal. There are uh, other countries I could cite, but uh, you know donors have worked with uh, women's groups around microfinance. Uh, they've worked uh, with uh, you know, through NGOs uh, and with the government on uh, helping ensure, really, in fact, by law in Nepal, that women are represented on the community forest user group management sort of structures. The two women you saw today in the photograph, one of them was the, is the chairman of the community user forest group, and the other is the treasurer. And in fact, we see this as, as sort of a typical sort of, of uh, sort of a demographic characteristic of leadership with respect to community forest uh, management. And there are a variety of explanations for this. Uh, including, uh, some would argue, the absence of a lot of men uh, who have migrated. But, you know, these are women who have strong leadership uh, capabilities. Uh, the, the chairman really ran the meeting uh, today. Uh, she owns a business. Um, and they really feel, and we've, we've got significant evidence, that the rights to evolution has empowered women, maybe uh, uh, most especially, uh, to sort of get out of the household, to have sort of an independent life, uh, and uh, all, much of this life is organized uh, in groups. Let me also mention that in Nepal, 35% of all the revenue generated by the community forest user groups are set aside for the scheduled cast. So there's, you know, it's a long discourse. It's sort of a socialization process that NGOs have contributed to, uh, that the government has contributed to. Um, and, well, you know, there was actually a Maoist uh, revolution here, an insurgency, which also contributed to this sort of outcome of, uh, uh, of a greater sense and recognition for gender equity. We often hear this in uh, conversation. So that's something that donors and others have really made decisive contributions to. Here and in many other places, I'm sure that my co-panelists could cite other examples. Thank you, excellent. Um, so David, over to you in the hot seat. Uh, how do donors and influence you, um, uh, governance interventions and their social, very specific social goals at the forefront? Sure, um, and I think a lot of this comes into how the donors try and um, put some of their investments uh, towards some of those social goals, but in kind of uh, more effective ways, um, which itself can be a challenge for us. 
Um, but I'll start by kind of highlighting a lot of people have spoken about uh, you know the, the, the TAP model, but this, you know the, this question of kind of agency. Um, and so I think there are many ways to work on um, kind of donor support um, to you know for social accountability for for other kind of you know generally governance interventions that are aimed towards sectors, but in ways that. Um, you know, to borrow a term that I learned from uh, from Just Associates, a feminist organization, but I, you see it around a lot, um, to kind of help um, start by building people's power within. And I think that that's for us in the DRG Center, it's a key kind of part of our, why we value integration as an area of work is because um, working on tangible issues and working with people to, to kind of know and access what their rights entitle them to um, really can give them a different sense of how they can act and the agency they have. Um, and then um, kind of building on that with more um, investing in ways of getting actors to work together, both on service delivery and on kind of governance um, interventions related to service delivery that um, reinforce and build different kinds of social capital. I think there's a lot of evidence that that matters. And again, from a kind of DRG perspective, we've been very concerned to see shrinking space for civil society globally. Um, you know, lots of civil society leaders when speaking in their own words and asked about where does your legitimacy come from, it comes from being, being able to make tangible differences for people in the issues they confront that they, you know, that the community, people in communities address every day and need every day, um, you know, whether that's access to education, whether that's health, whether that's resource management. Um, so those are kind of important areas for us to um, you know, we're, we're frequently working with civil society. I think there are ways don donors can do that in ways that reinforce their connections with each other and their legitimacy to speak to policy questions and accountability questions in part because they also are helping to deliver services that matter in those sector outcomes. Um, and then also from the DRG Center, we've done some um, investments in research around when do grassroots reforms scale. Um, and again, a lot of this goes to kind of bringing in of um, credible local voices. Um, you know, a lot of them came down to kind of uh, groups of doctors or engineers, people who are not directly involved in reform efforts or seen as politically active, but who had the credibility in the society to say, this is a good solution. It should be done in every, every village, every city, whatever it was. Um, and so again, I think there are ways that donors can work on uh, you know, water and sanitation, on food security, on different issues that um, pilot, you know, you mentioned uh, community health insurance schemes, um, you know, we can kind of help to promote and pilot some of those experiments and do so in ways that link them with others to increase the likelihood of policy change at scale and kind of longer term sustainable success. I think the challenge for us around all of this is that these are not make it so investments. These are not okay. I am going to deliver this array of services in education and health and I need it ring-fenced against corruption, so please anti-corruption it, um, which is often the starting point for a lot of the integration conversation. Um, it's, it's more of a facilitation way of working. It's more of a way of working where we're going to place some investments into key local actors who are going to own and drive a lot of the work and then allow their relationships with each other and their learning and experience over time to inform how that leads to kind of broader changes at scale. So I think frankly just working on governance issues is sometimes a challenge in the social sectors because these ways of doing it are different than the ways that you just manage um, kind of service delivery at large scale. Um, and so I think it's very much possible and I think a lot of the areas of emphasis that we put in as donors in terms of how we invest are as important as what we invest in. Um, you know, even in the marshalling the evidence work that we collaborated on, uh, you know, the community scorecards um, were associated in some instances with great outcomes and in other instances with very little. And a lot of that seemed to have to do, to your point, with how they were introduced, who led the process, was it actually a locally owned thing, because the actual underlying intervention isn't a correct assessment of where people are getting or falling short of what they deserve. It's their conversation with each other. And that, that can be a, a challenge to kind of work on at the intersection of sectors, but I think that there's a lot of very good experience and very good learning um, within the development community as a whole pushing us in those directions. Thanks very much, David. Um, okay, so moving on, um, so we've been hearing about the, the commonality of these interventions, governance interventions, how important they are, how donors can influence them. 
Um, but we've also been hearing about, actually, we're all very concerned about vulnerable communities in countries. So we often work in the same country. So how can we better work together so these, this combination of, of effects on governance can actually benefit the vulnerable communities that we're also concerned about? So Carol, over to you. Sure. It's a, it's a wonderful question. It's a difficult one to answer for sure. I mean, I will say weak governance perpetuates gender inequities and it alienates vulnerable populations. So we've got to address this. And as I said earlier, our theory of world learning theory of change around this has to do with ensuring that people have you know access to agency, power, and just access. Um, I think one thing that we need to be we need to remember in all of this is that it's not just about those who don't have power, for example, or agency or access. It's about those who do. So, um, one one example that I will get that I will give in this case is, I mean, if you talk about maybe a cross sectoral, let's say, a minister of finance, which regardless of whether you're working in education or health or you know, it's cross perhaps, depending upon how the government is structured, it's cross-cutting the various sectors. And so just as we do, I do, I've gone through leadership development um, to make sure that I'm, that I'm governing in the best way that I can, that I'm aware of the issues, that I'm aware of the, of the sensitivities within my staff, the differences, the need to ensure that, that we're hi our hiring practices are fair, that they are reaching out to vulnerable populations, so do ministers need the same kinds of support. And so as we're engaging with interventions on leadership development, we can include, if we have those dialogues at a, at a country level where we're, we're engaging, and some countries do, and some development communities do a better job of, of communicating across sectors, um, certainly donors can help to coordinate that um, so that we are providing the kinds of development to those who have power and by development I mean professional development so that they can begin to change maybe their viewpoint the way they're looking at things and then that can trickle down across ministries um, and can begin to influence the way those with power access and agency can make changes in classrooms in our case um, in procurements how procurements are done um, to ensure that hiring practices reach out to populations, to ensure that programs are reaching out to, to communities that would otherwise be overlooked. So that's just one example that I would give in terms of how we can uh, collaborate and, and benefit regardless of whether or not we as a development organization are actually implementing um, in a particular sector or in a, with a particular part of the government. Thanks very much. Um, Christy. Yeah, so um, in, in CARE, again, we have major focus on women and girls. We're very um, passionate about putting them at the, at the center of, of everything that we do in, in development. Um, and we see, particularly when we're talking about food and nutrition security, and you'll see I keep throwing nutrition in there because food security doesn't automatically translate to improved nutrition outcomes. So, so we focus on, on that very specifically. Um, but uh, power dynamics um, have a lot to do with, with those outcomes um, for women, whether it's access to, to land, um, that they may not have legal rights, or even if they do have legal rights, um, just cultural uh, norms do not allow them to, to access that. Um, access to markets, um, active, um, access to uh, extension services. Um, extension services may focus on, on male-dominated cash crops, and they're, they're not really focused on um, uh, things that women are, are traditionally more uh, likely to, to follow. Um, and so when we talk about making sure that um, vulnerable communities are, are, are engaged in and benefiting from this, uh, there, there's two things that we, we heavily focus on. Um, one is just around addressing social norms. Um, we have a, an approach um, that, that we do, it's an intensive um, approach, oftentimes in, in families, um, where we get husbands and wives uh, to, to take usually nine months to a year of, we're meeting with them you know, every week to, to talk about power dynamics, to talk about household decision making, um, to, to talk about gender-based violence and, and different things. Um, and it, it's an intensive um, and somewhat expensive model, but it's incredibly effective um, in changing uh, power dynamics in, in, a, in a household. 
um, we have applied that as well to um, health service providers of working with them um, as well as extension officers um, of helping them to understand um, uh, biases, power dynamics, to, to focus on what are specific needs of men versus women, of boys versus girls. Um, and that brings into uh, service provision um, a really important uh, gender aspect um, that isn't often, often there. Um, we've introduced um, gender dialogues into our farmer field uh, business schools. Um, really interesting in Malawi, we do gender dialogues, we do uh, a focus on climate change. We have a number of things that we do as part of our farmer field business schools. The government of Malawi has now adopted that in all of their extension services. Um, so it's really important that we're not only just talking about gender at, at a community level, but that it's making its way into the systems, um, that it's making it w its way into, into those national um, conversations. Um, and where we've been successful in getting governments to adapt some of these principles is they see the impact. Um, they, they see the, the value um, that when you introduce um, a gender lens into programming, um, that um, outcomes increase, um, that um, in, in many ways it's somewhat of an untapped market <laughs> um, that uh, they haven't always realized before that when um, women uh, start producing more, have better access to, to market, um, then uh, we see improvement. So I'll, I'll stop there. Those are just a couple of thoughts. Great, thanks very much. So we've had working with power, working on power dynamics, particularly around gender. How else can we be working together, David? Um, so I think those were some great answers. So I think the only thing that I'll add is just um, sometimes when we start to use the terminology around marginalized communities, we start to um, focus on how do we put in place a set of institutional arrangements that will enable them to get things. And I think particularly with, uh, you know, for us with this self-reliance paradigm, but just generally in terms of the next iteration of what it means to work on kind of governance, we really need to move to kind of um, how, do we, how do we support marginalized actors, seeing them within a system, to be able to get things themselves rather than change the institutional arrangements so that barriers to their access are removed. Um, and that's kind of a different conception of what the work is. And it, it does, I think, to the points both of you made, um, mean needing to work both with those who already have some power as well as with marginalized communities and linking them up somewhat um, and you know, allowing them to have more voice in how they can pursue and what they can pursue in terms of access rather than just trying to kind of fix it at the center for them by combating the powerful on their behalf. Um, and so I think that over the long run, making sure that our programming is building that, um, those norm shifts, that understanding, that sense of kind of um, empowering, um, even when we're working with marginalized communities, um, is, is important to, um, to benefiting those communities over time. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, right. So we're now that's, um, um, so thank you to the panelists. We'd like to open it up now for any questions. We have sort of, I think, 10, 10 15 minutes. Um, I'm not sure if we have people online asking questions, but if we did not yet, but um, maybe people in the audience. So um, and we'll have a, take a few questions and we'll get the panelists to respond. So maybe you could say who you are and who you're working with. Thank sure. you. Um, I'm, uh, oh, thanks. <coughs> I'm uh, Timothy Ryan, uh, Asia Director Solidarity Center, also work with the Global March Against Child Labor. I'm interested to find out within the, within the spheres of, of expertise and experience that you all have been discussing here, are there within the umbrellas of particular FDGs, whether it's food security or education or whatever, constituent groups that are forming? For instance, under I, um, SDG number eight, there's an Alliance 8.7, which is focused very specifically on child labor, forced labor, trafficking, and so on that is a whole constituency group now composed of NGOs, the UN governments, uh, employers, that are working together on that particular issue. Are there similar sorts of groups that have formed under other SDGs? Because this is an area where a lot of the connection uh, can really take place. From our perspective on the child labor side, obviously uh, both gender and education are important elements. Thank you. Um, two in the middle of that row there. Hi, I'm Nikki Palmer. I'm um, an ex DFID, very recently ex DFID senior governance and conflict advisor. And really great to hear about everybody talking about governance. Um, I have a question 
I suppose mainly for David, um, which is really a slightly more critical take on the application of political economy analysis and also really doing our best at thinking and working politically. I'm a big believer in considering politics and context at every stage of what we do. But we haven't, we've had this sort of analysis for 20 plus years and we're still only just managing to talk about it within some of these settings, which is a shame. Um, my question really is about programming. The programming is the main vehicle through which we spend money on a lot of what we're talking about here. We haven't been as successful as we could have been about making that program adaptive enough to political context. Um, there are some good examples, but donors often don't have a great deal of success in making their programming adaptive for lots and lots of different reasons. So I'm interested in your thoughts on how we go about making sure that the analysis, which is getting better, talked about more often, applied more cross-sectorally now than it has been before, is actually able to influence the way that program, is, program money is spent. Thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Mirwai Rahimzai, and I'm Regional Director, East Africa for University Research Company. And I had the pleasure of being in very close contact with HFG project in countries that I worked with. So. Thank you for the excellent work and the HFG project. We have seen basic package of health services, basic package of hospital services, basic package of child health services. Do you think it's time to define the basic package of governance interventions or governance services so that at the ministry level, when someone is taken from a hospital and made head of a department, he knows what are some of the skills that he has to learn and what are some of the processes that he has to be focusing on, what are some of the indicators, as well as the outcomes that he has to be or she has to be focusing on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, actually, maybe we, maybe we take one more question, then we'll, I think we'll have to go back to the panelists because we're running out of time. Hi, Lara Ho from International Rescue Committee. Um, so most of the examples that I think people talked about were in states, whether or not their democracies have relatively functioning institutions. Um, I work largely in places where often those institutions, whether it's the actual provider of service delivery or sort of the frameworks for policy, aren't very functional. Um, we found that you can do a certain amount of things at the community level, like scorecards and things to affect change, but at a certain point, if the institutions don't exist or aren't functional, there's limits. And so I'm curious if there, you have examples from places where institutions are not at a basic functioning level. How do you use governance interve interventions to achieve outcomes in terms of strengthening service delivery and uh, strengthening the system? Thanks. Great, thanks, great question. Um, okay, so I mean, we are, the panelists will be around afterwards. So if we do, I'm sure you've got some other questions, we can come back to it. So. Um, Four questions. I'm going to start with Steve online. I'm not sure if you heard that, but are you anything you want to say? Any response to those questions? Oh, I lost Steve <laughs> to his field trip. <laughs> Land Rover's got yes, can you hear me? Oh, Steve, oh. right. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay, right. Now, let me respond to the last question if I could. Uh, I think it's a very important question, obviously. Uh, uh, and I, I, I suppose I could address it from two, two angles. One, of course, from the land side, where I work principally, we find that customary tenure arrangements, which are often not recognized statutorily in, in law, but really provide the basis for uh, organizing access to land at the community level as a social right. And this is very important. This is the great value of customary tenure arrangements. Uh, one has access to land as a bona fide member in the community. That these are often very resilient institutions. They operate uh, under the radar. Uh, and increasingly, there's you know efforts to give them statutory recognition at a level equal to you know private land and, and, and government land. But I think that you know, these are informal in, 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 re in relation to the SDGs, which which tend to SDG 16 which tends to basically speak about formal institutions and, and arguably doesn't give sufficient recognition to informal arrangements, which are you know, 
quite something other than a committee. I mean, these are very deeply, uh, long established, deeply imbued uh, principles for uh, providing access to land. Then, then these are institutions that you want to try to work with. Now, in conflict areas or, or areas where people have been displaced, which is where you work um, often, then those institutions are often, uh, they're often place specific. So it's, it's difficult for people to carry them with them, obviously. But I would just note this is, um, th th this is something that's very, the, the informal institutions may be overlooked in some context in ways that uh, uh, we might take better advantage of in our approaches. Great, thanks. Um, so back to the panelists. Other questions anyone like to take up? We have one on, on, on the constituent groups around the SDGs, um, around programming, which I'm going to come back to David at the end about that one, <laughs> and, and about should we be looking for governance basic, basic package? I can Christine. take the basic package as one. I think it's a really interesting, interesting question. I don't know that I have an answer of what that basic package would look like. But I do think that there's a need in, in the development community to make governance more of a central conversation. Um, I think it's something that, you know, is there are certain organizations that, that are doing governance, right? Um, and one, one thing that we've done in, in CARE, it is now a foundational objective or focus of all of our, our programming um, is to in, make sure it's happening. Now, actually making it happening is, is somewhat challenging. Um, but I, I think one step is that it just needs to be more of a central conversation and more organizations need to adapt it as a, a foundational part of their, their programming. Uh, the other point I would say is that I, I think another aspect that's missing in, in the conversation or maybe just none of us have figured out how to do it well yet, um, is taking the community aspect of it and linking it to the institutional aspect of it, right? That we're kind of divided of, there's those of us who do community inclusive and governance and those who do it at a, at a you know, much more national or systems level or, or whatnot. Um, and I, I think we're, we're missing that, that nexus of, of how, do we, how do we combine that. And, and CARE has been successful in doing it in a few countries uh, of taking things that start at the community level and, and really translating those to a national scale. But we're still figuring out how to do that well. Um, and I, I think the more that organizations can put this at the forefront of the development conversation, then collectively we will start to, to be able to solve that problem. But right now we're just working in so many different silos that um, we're missing the opportunity to, to really come up with those solutions and maybe potentially address your, your question about a package of services. Great, thanks very much. Um, so, Carol, the, about constituency groups? And there, I, yeah. I know less about that. There are, for sure, um, constituency groups. Um, I'm not at all fluent on that, so I'm not really good at responding to that particular question, but can certainly find out more. Um, but I would like to say on the question that, that the woman from IRC asked, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Um, I speak, world learning is not a, does not work generally in the, those kind of environments, but as a professional, I used to. I started out my career in relief, and I was just thinking, you know, in, not in all cases, but somebody has agency access and power. So that's, I mean, you can adopt similar frameworks to try to explore, well, then who's got the power and who's the most vulnerable in this context and apply some of those theories as you're trying to, you know, prevent harm and all of that. And then that's but I'll give you an example that I just experienced when I was in Lebanon not that long ago and met with several Syrian activist organizations. So they were out of Syria in, in Lebanon. And one of the things that was, we were conversing, you know, I said, well, if you can't do it right now in Syria, think about, get yourself pre-positioned and think about what you can do now because you're going to go back, somebody's going to go back and deliver, start, start this all up and deliver services. Why not do what you can now in this environment to be ready for when, when something changes within that country? And don't sort of sit, sit here and think, oh, what, what, I have to do something here in this space, but I can't. Well, you can. So I mean, I guess I'm just thinking there are other ways of viewing in difficult, complex environments, viewing how to set the future up to be successful because you've got all in that environment you've got all kinds of amazing people that are out of the country 
work with them now as organizations to get them ready. Um, so that's what I would suggest. Thanks very much. So David, I'll move to you about the, the programming question. I'm going to hand over to Eric for the, the close. Great. Um, and uh, so thank you. It's a very good question and one that we've been keenly interested in. Uh, our framework was uh, you know, we had the fortune to have Diana Kamek come and help us work on it and she shared a lot of the experience from DFID and I remember talking with her after she'd left after a couple of years and we were trying to take stock of how our political economy practice was going and we said, you know, so what do you think? Are, are we doing well? And she said, well, tell me what the average length of your PEA is and the closer it is to 50 pages, the more you're failing. <laughs> so I think um, we've tried to be very intentional in framing um, kind of the, the push to assess power and to look at kind of um, at development work, frankly, as, as contestation rather than technical knowledge transfer. Uh, because in the age of Google, if it was just we don't know what arrangements to make, somebody could have found that out. So if it hasn't happened, there are reasons. Um, and to try and kind of work with our officers, so we, we tend to support political economy work in missions where they can dedicate at least one staff member to do a couple of the weeks of the field work. Um, and we've tried really hard in our context-driven adaptation collection to put more of an emphasis on how do you do this without it being an extra? How do you make the power dynamics something in your, we, we've had for a while now this CLA framework, collaborating, learning, and adapting that has really, we've, we've changed our internal guidance considerably to enable more adaptive management. Um, and you know, we've had great collaboration with our colleagues who push that out. Um, to kind of say, look, missions are already having to define their CLA spaces. They're having to do pause and reflect moments. They're having to do scenario planning for their strategies, all sorts of different entry points. Let's just take what we know about incentives and power dynamics and make that part of what gets considered in those places where the consideration is already happening. Um, you know, our local systems framework that pushes us to think about um, the sustainability and how we analyze the sustainability of development outcomes in terms of the system of actors around it and their roles and relationships. Let's look at why are they only playing certain roles, why are the relationships certain ways. So I think we've been trying to kind of um, take the whole kind of push of thinking and working politically, move it away from something where political economy analysis has primacy, um, where we do get requests for PEA, try and use it as kind of a gateway drug to get staff to see the development issue through a different lens, and then put that into the monitoring, evaluation, and learning, and particularly with an emphasis on learning and more support contracts for MEL. I think we could do better in investments in, in kind of data and in having more information that would be relevant for our programs to adapt against. But I think there's a lot of um, drivers and our job is to figure out how to make the TWP space part of all of that rather than its own bespoke thing that you need a governance advisor to work on and that you you need kind of a separate assessment and stream of work to build into programming. So I wouldn't say by any stretch that we've been fully successful but I think where we've had successes it really is where it's just part and parcel of somebody's kind of adaptive programming in their day job and there's some Really good examples from Liberia, Nigeria. I won't go into the details, but we have webinars and brown bags in our collection, which I'm happy to share the link with everyone. We also have a Thinking and Working Politically Learning listserv. If anyone was not on it and would like to be on it, it's open to both staff and partners and anybody else. Um, so please let me know. Um, and so we do try and share our materials and, and drill into kind of practical nuts and bolts to try and make this much more of a a felt reality around how programming looks rather than a kind of um, expertise driven practice area that's around specific um, analyses that you need outsiders to do for you. Um, it's a long way to go and I'm not sure that we've gotten that far yet but we do mean to make that squarely in our bullseye. David, thank you very much. And um, we are unfortunately running out of time so I'm gonna um, uh, ask you for a round of applause for our panelists. That's yeah, been excellent. Um, and I'd like you to just say where you are, if that's okay. And uh, Eric Bjorn, we're very pleased to have Eric Bjornland from um, Democ Democracy International um, um, to close up. Thank you, Bob. Um, promoting effective, inclusive, and accountable governance has been a key part of our collective approach to international development and sustaining the and working on the sustainable development goals for uh, and those kinds of issues for many years and by that I mean our, our entire international development community. Today USAID's focus on the journey to self-reliance recognizes that a country's commitment to governance and particularly the degree to which its laws, policies, 
actions and informal governance mechanisms support progress towards self-reliance is one of two critical factors to securing self-reliance for any nation. And I think our excellent discussions today demonstrate the recognition that governance issues are critical across development sectors. Uh, we, we've heard a number of examples of using a governance lens and address uh, some particular issues in diverse sectors, in, in health, in education, in food security, in resource management, and, and other sectors. And I think we, we heard some, some common themes across these examples. Um, we heard one, the very important uh, role of evidence, of, of learning from experience. Um, we know from, from, um, from decades of development assistance in, in all the sectors that we discussed today, and certainly in democracy, rights, and governance, that any approach must be evidence-based, politically attuned, and adaptive. Governance support in particular is no longer an ad hoc effort. There's significant research on what has and hasn't worked, and we need to learn from it. Um, a, a second theme we heard was the significant importance of always thinking and working politically across sectors throughout development. We heard about the importance of power and incentives, of policy change, of integration. Uh, a third uh, theme we heard from different sectors was the critical importance of engaging key actors uh, across um, the, the relevant stakeholders, the government, civil society, private sector, public, uh, local communities, the international community, including the international development assistance funders. Um, fourth, uh, and as a part of that, the critical importance of community participation and involving the community in, in development programs and policies. And finally, the, the, we recognize, reminded ourselves of, of the importance of trying to help vulnerable communities. Um, this discussion reminds me why we do this kind of work. My, my own view is that the pendulum in recent years in our rhetoric and our justification for our work has swung too far to just talking about how uh, us in, in investing in international development assistance uh, is, is something we should do because it supports our national security and our, our national economic opportunities. I think that the sustainable development goals in our discussion remind us that ultimately international development assistance is about the people we are trying to help, not about us. Um, and I think this is particularly important when we talk about governance. We want countries to be stable, at peace, and economically viable. First and foremost, our aid should be focused on helping developing nations to achieve their own path to democratic self-reliance and to democratic progress. Today's the day after we celebrated the 70th anniversary of the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I want to leave you with a quotation in this regard from Nelson Mandela, who once said, quote, for to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of others. Thank you um, to our panelists, to all of our panelists, for enlightening us with their excellent presentations and insights. I thought those were absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you to uh, thank APT for, uh, for organizing this program. It, it's been a delight for Democracy International to work with APT on this series. I want to thank Jackie for your welcome and Bob for, for really uh, excellent, thoughtful moderation. Uh, and um, I want to thank all of you who are here um, because I know you all are committed to this work and many of you are involved in this work, and so thank you for your work uh, supporting sustainable development and governance around the world, and we look forward to continuing these discussions in the, in the coming months. Um, and I understand we have some food, so I hope you'll stay and, 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 and we'll all continue to talk to each other. So thank you. Thank <laughs> 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 you.